He was an Austrian by birth. He came over to the United States with the uh, singer Jenny Lynn and toured the country with her. He was one of her principal violinists. And when they came to Fayetteville in the 1850s, he liked the town so much that he stayed there. And he went to work teaching music in uh, the female seminary in Fayetteville. If you know anything about Fayetteville, it's where it stood where First Baptist Church currently is on the corner of Dixon College. And he uh, is known to have published at least four pieces. He left uh, in 1863, along with the Tevitz family, ended up in San Francisco as a college music professor and married to a family. And he wrote this in 1853, had it published in St. Louis, again, the first piece of music published by the in Arkansas. And it is a traditional European folk. <laughs> By the way, one aside, uh, Ferdinand's brother was with him. He actually remained in Prairie Grove, lived out his life, and he has descendants still living in Prairie Grove, Arkansas. So this man's uh, brother's descendants still live there today. So. himself to be the hero of the battle. Uh, he was not the commanding general here. The commanding general here was actually Samuel R. Curtis. And uh, General Curtis actually performed a tremendously amazing feat here. He successfully turned his army during the battle because if, as you learn about the battle, you'll find that the Union army was entrenched down over Little Sugar Creek. The Confederate army came around them and attacked in two spots at the Lee Town Battlefield and also up here at Elkhorn Tavern. And Curtis had his supply wagons out on the field by Elkhorn. He had to move the supply wagons down, bring the army up, and he was really, honestly, the hero of the battle. But Siegel, who had done a very good job recruiting German immigrants to the Union Army in the St. Louis area, and had fought with General Lyon, who was killed at the Battle of Wilson's Creek up in Missouri by Springfield, took a role, he wanted more to do in the battle on the first day, and largely the reports are they wandered around the battlefield finding, trying to find something. But the second day, he ended up being in charge of the artillery that would bombard <coughs> the Confederate lines, 21 guns on Wellfleet's Knoll out here. And that fire of those 21 cannons went on for two hours. It really drove the Confederates off, and over 
they uh, one man counted over 1,800 <coughs> shots being fired in the first hour on the Union side before he gave up counting. So we estimate somewhere you know 35, 3600 shots, one every two seconds during the time that those cannons were going off. They could be heard in Fayetteville, Arkansas. So Siegel made sure that he promoted himself. And the Eastern newspapers hailed him as the hero because a lot of his troops, who were German immigrants also, wrote about the great contribution he made to this battle. He, uh, and of course, Christopher Bach, being a German-American immigrant, would have seen Siegel as a huge hero. So unfortunately, Curtis did not get a march written about him, or if he did, I haven't been able to find it. But this piece is also in the vault here at Pea Ridge. It is going to sound a little more like the William Tell Overture than it's going to sound like Sue's March. Mm -hmm. So, because again, it, their concept of a march is very different from our more modern uh, thoughts of what a march would be. So, this is the Peerage March, respectfully <coughs> dedicated to Major General Francis <coughs> USA, hero of the Battle of Peerage.
A lot of the music you're going to hear today is from the 26th North Carolina Regiment Band. It is the only known surviving band book from any of the Confederate bands. I'm also going to say, though, that you're going to find a lot of the music was the same on both sides. We were not fighting culture against culture. The same popular, mu popular music was the same popular music. Now, the reason we have the 26th North Carolina band books is they started out as a town band from Salem, North Carolina. They're a Moravian group of musicians who started out as a local town band who all got recruited together and they played together. And because of being Moravian and they're uh, not wanting to fight, they were surgical assistants most of the time. If they weren't playing music, they were helping the doctors and, and dealing with the injured. So the next piece we're going to play is a popular piece of music. Um, and the other neat thing was, if a band got overtaken by the other side, the new band from the winning side, whatever side that was, took the better music and the better instruments for their use. Mm -hmm. So it really becomes mixed as to whose was a southern arrangement or northern arrangement because they were, they were just totally intermixed. This was a common popular piece for the day called Come Dearest, Daylight is Gone. said we are doing the best we can to match the instruments of the time. We have a couple of actual cornets in our group which would have been the proper instrument of the time. They didn't have trumpets yet. We do have some E-flat horns which although they're modern instruments, we would call them modern instruments, those are basically created off the old one. You probably wouldn't see trombones. You would see something more like this. This is a B-flat tenor horn. Uh, this is actually, I found this at a junk sale for $20, and as best I can get, it was 1880s, maybe earlier than that. It's going to be restored. That's on my list of things to do. But um, this would be more common what you might see. So our instruments are pitched the right way. We just don't have all the original instruments. I say, yeah, we're hoping one day to win the lottery and be able to buy a whole set. Um, the next piece is most... Although, like I said, a lot of music was not really one side or the other because we all listened to the same popular music. But this next piece is pretty much mostly known for the North. It was from a Methodist hymn called Say Brothers Will You Meet Us? And a certain lady was asked to write lyrics for it, and that was Julia Ward Howe. And we're going to do Battle Hymn of the Republic. Thank you. 
for some of the younger in the audience. What do you think the people that time used to dance to? Did they have uh, Bluetooth MP3 players? You're looking at me like I'm crazy. Did they have CDs? You know those round things? Or albums, those bigger round things? Or I even have it on my Victrola, the crank up that had the round thing. What do you think? They didn't have any of those. The only way they could do popular music or hear the popular music at the time or dance to the music at the time at parties was to have a band or musicians play. That was all there was. We didn't have any recorded type music back then. So this next piece we're playing is called Captain Horton's Waltz. This was not uncommon. Captain Horton was one of the officers in the 26th North Carolina who favored the band and helped the band out. So one of their band members decided to write a waltz in his name so maybe he'd keep helping pass out money to them and, and keeping the band around. So this is Captain Horton's Waltz. No repeat on the last section. No repeat on the last section of the BC. Thank you. 
So, like I said, back in this time, the bands also played the very popular, mu popular music of the time, and it was typically popular for the whole country, not just north or south, although some songs favored the others. Um, it was also said, and the reason I brought up Captain Horton, I forgot to mention with this, it was a matter of pride to have a good band with your military unit. Uh, sometimes the officers put money out of their own pocket to help fund the band if their hierarchy wouldn't want to have a band. So it was a big deal of pride, which is why earlier we named the one the Captain Horton as well. But bands were very popular back then, and the music was very popular. How many have heard of the Battle of the Bands? Probably more rock and roll stuff. Well, there is a Battle of the Bands back in the Civil War time. In the winter of 1862-1863, across the Rappahannock River in Virginia, the North was on the North side and the South was on the South. And one night, the North Band decided to play a song and all their people cheered. Well, guess what happened on the South side of the river? Their band heard, so they played the same song, their arrangement of it. And their band cheered. And it said this went on till the wee hours of the morning almost. For like two, three hours, the band would play their version until they all end up playing, I think, Our Old Home, where everybody cheered together and had one of those sort of group moments, not being enemies, but being, you know, fellow Americans and all that. But there was a battle of bands even back in the Civil War. It never did say which band won. It just said at the end they all played the same song and everybody sort of cried and hooped and hollered and it was all there. The next piece we're going to play has been listed as possibly one of the most popular pieces in American history. It's written by a couple of British gentlemen, and this is a song called Ever V. And I guess if it was American Top 40 back then, this would have been number one for a whole lot of weeks. And like I said, it is listed as possibly the most popular song in American history. So we're going to play Ever V. There are two versions of the story. In one version of the story, the original version, um, 
which played up north for a while, but was deemed to be too complimentary of Arkansas. The uh, hillbilly gives them directions, but then invites them to a meal and plays some music, and they sing and dance together. In the second one, the version that they decided was a little more accurate according to some sensibilities for people living in this part of the world in Arkansas, that uh, the traveler said, well, you can't get there from here, and shunned the man and played music every time he would ask that question. So we're, we're playing the first version, and it is a little more friendly to our state <coughs> and to uh, the folks that are sitting here. This is the Arkansas Traveler.
We thank you for staying with us and listening. This is going to play, we are going to play our last song. This is one that will be very well known to you probably, but what you may not realize, uh, it was very well known again in both sides of the Mason-Dixon line. We're going to play Dixie and Bonnie Blue Flag. Um, but come to find out, one of President Lincoln's favorite tunes was Dixie. And he was known to whistle it in the Oval Office of the White House when he was president. So that's why I say again, all this music, although may have, some of it may have come from a Confederate band book or from a Northern band book, it was all pretty much the same music. And it was, but the bands, it was interchangeable. So we're going to close with, oh, I also want to say, General Lee had said that a, a military could not go without a band and thought it was a necessary part of each division or, or whatever size of a military group have a band. It was also said during the Civil War time, some of them sounded like angelic choirs and some of them brayed like mules. We're hoping we are on the more angelic side and not the brayed like mules side. So we're going to end with Dixie and Bonnie Blue Flag. I want to say something I forgot when we played Arkansas Traveler. I mentioned early on, we talked about the 37th Illinois Band um, that was here in Northwest Arkansas for an extended period of time. When the Army came down Telegraph Road, the Union Army came down Telegraph headed to Elkhorn, they stopped at the Arkansas State Line because they wanted to make a grand entry, if you will, and they brought General Curtis to the head of the column, the 37th, assuming the 37th Illinois, because that's the band we know was here for sure. The band was asked to play Arkansas Traveler in Dixie as General um, Curtis made his triumphal entry into Arkansas. And it's also mentioned that at the Leetown Battlefield, they the 37th was deployed over there, and as the battle started, the band did indeed play the day of uh, March 7th, the morning of the battle, and they also played those same two songs there in addition to all their other music. So those were actually significant enough to the Army that they wrote them down that those two were played. So uh, we hope we're representing, this is a period arrangement of this, so we hope we represent <coughs> closely to the way that they would have played it here in Arkansas 157 years ago. Thank you. Thank you.